Australia is a nation defined by starkness. Evoking images of the New World and mirroring the process of Western expansion, European settlers arrived on an untamed continent, pushed across vast wilderness through hostile indigenous populations, and established then doggedly defended a few narrow bands of civilization. As the years rolled forward, cascading sequences of gold rushes and increasing need for agricultural output pulled Australian society further from the convenient natural harbors where it began. With man and beast continuously working to reclaim the land they usurped, the increasingly small and informal groups of settlers on the frontier relied on their more advanced weaponry to maintain their foothold. Guns matured into a standard-issue piece of kit for those straying beyond the established towns. A century on, that reality remained. 20th century Australians continued to leave the comfortable confines of coastal cities in hope of transforming rural land into a living. Those that found themselves in this less urban life, in turn, inherited a unique culture and identity framed around individualism and rugged self-reliance. These individuals were proud of their lifestyle, providing for their families and nation through what they helped pull from the earth. Yet, even as technology advanced, nature proved unruly, and so rural Australians continued to rely on their weaponry to defend their crops or livestock or minerals from the other. Among this population, guns had become conflated with culture. They were important tools, they were pest control, they were family heirlooms, they were security. But as urban Australia continued to develop alongside rural Australia, guns in cities and suburbs began to seem superfluous. Tools no longer worth the inherent risk of operating, and in untrained or uncertain hands, potential disasters. All the while, as this rift widened, the weapons grew more effective. The destructive potential of a minute shrunk down to a second. What was once but a cultural difference morphed into an issue. Should personal gun ownership be allowed? Was the necessity of some stronger than the risk to most, as the potential for misuse grew in step with technological development? As the century progressed, as the cosmopolitan and countryside continued to drift apart, the issue escalated, and the questions informing the issue begged for an answer. Australia's gun debate, informed by history, landscape, and legacy, intensified by growing urban-rural divide and the technology's ruthless efficiency, was at an impasse. As one exasperated New South Wales politician voiced after a futile national gun summit in 1987, quote, "...it will take a massacre in Tasmania before we get gun reform in Australia." Nearly a decade later, his words proved prophetic. It was just after one in the afternoon, on the 28th of April, 1996, when a 28-year-old man in a yellow Volvo entered the Port Arthur historic site. Carrying what security described as a sports-type bag through the tourist-laden formal penal colony, the man entered a busy cafe, ate a meal, then opened fire on unsuspecting tourists. Within just 90 seconds, the gunman had killed 20 people with 29 bullets. Leaving the cafe, the shooting then continued onto the streets. By the time of his capture the following day, the gunman had killed 35 and injured another 23. In the hands of the murderer throughout his rampage was a semi-automatic Colt AR-15, a weapon that, under Tasmania's uniquely hands-off gun laws, was available for purchase without a license. All told, it was the worst mass shooting in the nation's history, and while perpetrated in a far corner of the country, the sheer depravity rocked Australia to its core. For a moment, the shocked nation stammered. Then it began to move. While the Port Arthur shooting was Australia's largest, it was far from the country's first. The Hoddle Street killings and the Queen Street Massacre just months apart in Melbourne in 1987 had set the backdrop for that year's ultimately fruitless National Gun Summit. The gun violence continued into the new decade too, with one or more shootings in 1990, 91, 92, and 93. In 10 years, Australia experienced 12 mass shootings, abruptly ending the lives of 98 people. While gun ownership was common across the nation's history, the increase in mass shootings and the high firearm death rate of 2.84 per 100,000 people, well above England's rate of 0.42 per 100,000, were becoming too much for most Australians to bear. By 1996, punctuated by the most horrific shooting of them all, Australians had had enough. 
In a poll run days after the Port Arthur massacre, 90% of the 2,058 respondents supported a national ban on automatic and semi-automatic firearms, and 88% supported registration requirements for all firearms. Simply put, average, everyday Australians were ready for change. But popular public attitudes won't move policy alone. A fundamental restructuring of Australian gun laws was anything but a foregone conclusion in the wake of Port Arthur. Any attempt at sweeping change would have to navigate around the country's powerful gun lobby, a vocal and impassioned minority of rural Australians wary of government overreach, and the fact that gun policy was governed not by the federal government, but by states. And yet, the day after the shooting, John Howard, Australia's Prime Minister for all of 48 days, announced his effort to push through major gun law reform. Howard and his coalition government had ample room to cop out, to throw their hands up and say it was a state-level issue. Instead, they pushed on. As he later reflected, quote, You never let a good crisis go to waste. Tragic though the event was, it gave us an opportunity to do something in the wake of it so that those lives were not lost in vain. In the days that followed, cabinet meetings poured over studies pulled together by non-governmental groups like the Coalition for Gun Control and previously internally produced policy recommendations that followed the Melbourne shootings. Outside of cabinet meetings, Howard urged representatives from his coalition of Liberal and National Party members to stand with him. But as Howard applied pressure on conservatives representing rural Australia, so too did the nation's gun lobby, which organized marches, street demonstrations, and speeches. Ultimately, the lobby's mobilization proved detrimental to its own cause, as arguments made in media that 99.9% .9 of gun owners abide by the law, for example, gave way to high-profile figures like the vice president of the Firearm Owners Association threatening bloodshed if stricter regulations went through. In less than a week after the Port Arthur massacre, the political determination emanating from Parliament had resulted in a cabinet agreement on a prohibition on automatic rifles, semi-automatic rifles, and pump-action shotguns, the creation of a national firearm registration system, and a compensation fund for a gun buyback program. Four days later, on May 10th, the Prime Minister hosted the police ministers from all states and territories to present the 10-point plan that soon informed the nation's first set of universal gun laws, what would be known as the National Firearms Agreement. Even with broad public support, the NFA was hard won. Queensland, the Northern Territory, and Western Australia refused to agree to the NFA for months and pushed for semi-automatics to remain legal as long as they were crimped, or modified to carry limited rounds. Only after Howard threatened to expand federal power did they join the nationwide program. In some places, the NFA was bitterly resented. During speaking tours intended to explain and promote the program, Deputy Prime Minister Tim Fisher was burned in effigy in the Queensland state of Gympie, while Prime Minister Howard donned a bulletproof vest when speaking in Sale, Victoria. With all states and territories signed on by the middle of 1996, the agreement flipped Australia's loose, decentralized gun laws on their head. What was once a system so scant that a law student reading through gun statues thought there were pages missing had suddenly become one of the world's most thorough. Every gun and gun sale now had to be recorded in a national registry. Anyone who owned or sought to own a gun needed to prove they had a genuine reason. Crucially, in the eyes of Australian policymakers, self-defense was not one. Semi-automatic rifles and shotguns were now banned except for when a farmer or professional shooter could prove genuine reason. Gun owners now needed to be 18 or older, needed to pass a safety course, and had to abide by strict gun storage rules. And if in possession of a newly prohibited gun, Australians now had 12 months to surrender it and receive fair compensation, funded by a one-time Medicare levy. A year later, Australia had confiscated and destroyed 650,000 guns, and it did so under budget, as the project cost Australian taxpayers around $360 million. So, did it work? Did the sweeping, disruptive reforms of the National Firearms Agreement actually save lives? Well, in the decade leading up to the Port Arthur Massacre, the country experienced 12 shootings with at least four fatal victims, totaling 98 individuals killed. In the decade after the Port Arthur Massacre, Australia experienced none. In fact, in the 26 years since, there have been only three mass shootings with a total of 12 victims. Proponents point to this as the conclusive piece of evidence that Australia's gun restrictions were a masterstroke of public policy a single maneuver that solved a massive, deadly problem. But others are quick to point out that mass shootings are a relatively rare event. Even during Australia's most notorious and deadly decade of shootings, 
they occurred just over once a year. While undoubtedly tragic on a human level, from a statistical standpoint, this frequency instills relatively low confidence in any observed trend. The confidence is lowered yet further when glancing back another decade. From 1976 to 1986, there were just two shootings with 10 total victims. So was the 10 years starting in 96 the deviation from the trend, or was it the 10 years starting in 86? Especially in the context of mass shootings, where shooters get inspired by shooters who get inspired by shooters, was there simply a spate of violence followed by a regression to the mean? To determine this, one can substitute this low frequency statistic for a higher frequency equivalent. The more data points, the more one can be confident in causation over mere correlation. While the National Firearms Agreement was implemented in response to a mass shooting, it was concurrently designed to address all types of gun violence. So Australia's overall firearm mortality rate can be used as a proxy metric in examining the policy's effectiveness. In 1996, the year of the Port Arthur Massacre, this rate sat at 2.84 gun deaths per year per 100,000 people. Today, it's just 0 0.9. A threefold drop in less than three decades surely proves that gun control curbed gun violence, but some are quick to respond that trends don't mean anything in isolation. Glancing backwards, firearm fatality in Australia was already on the decline, and the drop from 2.84 was just a continuation of the drop from 4.7. Prior to 1996, according to research led by gun policy expert Philip Alpers, the rate of decline was an average of 3% a year. Post-1996, however, it accelerated to 4.9, a meaningful, measurable, near doubling in rate right after the most significant gun policy reform in decades. Now, while certainly stronger, there are still potentially holes in this proof. One could, and some have argued, that this too could be random chance. That the rate of decline had the option of staying the same, or decelerating, or accelerating post-1996, and it just so happened that the third option occurred. But there is yet another method of establishing causality, a method that has real-world, practical evidence behind its effectiveness. It's called rare event predictive modeling. You see, predictive modeling for common events is fairly straightforward. A streaming service like Netflix, for example, will use troves of data to build out a model for how long it expects a given customer to stick around based on factors like their age, home address, gender, and more. This model is useful since, if the company learns that a given sign-up in Illinois, for example, stays subscribed on average four months longer than a given customer from Massachusetts, the company can afford to spend more marketing to those Illinois-based customers since their lifetime value is higher. Netflix and others rely on the sheer quantity of data points to build out highly specific, highly accurate models like this. The rarer an event becomes, though, the tougher it is to build out an accurate predictive model. But it's not impossible. And the reason why it's not impossible is because time and money have been poured into developing and validating predictive models for rare events thanks to the massive industry it makes possible. Insurance. How the insurance industry works is simple. Individuals are way more afraid of having a 1 in 10,000 chance of having their home robbed and having to spend $100,000 to replace things than having a 1 in 10 chance of breaking their microwave and having to spend $100. That's despite the fact that in either scenario, the average person is going to be out $10 either way. $100,000 divided by $10,000 is $10, and so is $100 divided by $10. While in isolation illogical, this bias is in reality pragmatic since far more people can weather a $100 expense than a $100,000 one without going into debt and financial hardship. Therefore, what insurance does is aggregate 10,000 people with that 1 in 10,000 chance together and charge them each $10 so that the one of them that does get robbed doesn't go into financial ruin. Except they don't really charge them $10. They charge them, say, $11 so that they can turn a profit, but in order to do this, they need to determine what the likelihood of a given individual getting robbed is. And again, the events that insurance companies insure against are by their very nature rare because those are the ones people are worried about. Therefore, insurers need to take in a minuscule number of data points and build a predictive model based on them. If they do it wrong and consider home robberies more common than reality, they'll overcharge and a competitor will come in, undercut their prices, and capture all their customers. If they consider it less likely than reality, they'll run out of money from paying out more to robbed customers than they take in. Without diving into the mind-numbing mathematics behind rare event predictive modeling, 
The proof that it works is that the insurance industry exists. The proof is that these companies can only make a profit if they've accurately predicted the commonality of events as rare and unlikely as sinkholes, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, missile attacks, plane crashes, bear attacks, and more, damaging and destroying homes. The same rare event predictive modeling techniques were applied in research led by Simon Chapman of the University of Sydney's School of Public Health. He and his co-researchers looked at the data on Australian shootings in the same way an insurer would and built a rare events predictive model that indicated between 1996 and 2018, when the study was conducted, there should have been 16.3 mass shootings in the country, with a minimum of 65 fatal victims. In reality, there were just two. Building on that baseline, the researchers were able to calculate the likelihood that this trend could be explained simply by random chance, that the rarity of mass shootings meant that their 22-year absence was merely a data anomaly. The answer was 1 in 200,000. That's to say, there's a chance that the absence in mass shootings in Australia post-1996 was caused by the natural ebb and flow in their occurrence, but that chance is 1 in 200,000. Meanwhile, there's a 199,999 in 200,000 chance that something other than random chance is behind the trend. Something like the implementation of the most significant gun control measures in the country's history. One can't ever outright 100% prove a link between two separate occurrences in the real world. This is why people say that correlation does not imply causation. If you asked a data scientist to prove that flipping your light switch led to your light turning off, they tell you that there's a chance that the light was on a timer scheduled to switch off at that moment regardless. Or that there's a chance that the research assistant tasked with collecting data about switch flips and light illumination was being bribed to make them look more correlated than reality. Or that there's a chance that the light wasn't real in the first place and was just a hologram made to make you think it was turning off in time with the switch. These are all unlikely, but technically not impossible. In a world of infinite possibility, one can always find another genuinely possible cause for a given outcome. The data scientists will always tell you there's a one in a lot chance that something other than flipping the switch led to the light turning off. But probably not. It probably wasn't any of that. Flipping the light switch probably led to the light turning off. In every way, it's tough to make videos about subjects with the weight and tragic significance of this one. From word choice and motion graphics to visuals, and a close reading of YouTube's content guidelines, we have to put a lot of thought into how to cover and visualize this story. Thankfully, we have our sponsor Storyblocks, who has allowed us to take this subject on in the first place by sponsoring this tough to monetize video. Long before they sponsored this channel, Storyblocks was quite literally the first place I turned for stock footage. Its footage is what the very first video on this channel is almost entirely made up of. And because they're still built for small-scale independent creators, I still use Storyblocks for stock footage today. With their unlimited subscription, you can use and download all the material you want for less than what a single clip might run you at another stock footage provider. Storyblocks offers way more than just stock footage, too. They also carry After Effects and Premiere Pro templates, images, music, and sound effects. No matter what you end up using from their demand-driven library, though, you won't have to worry about royalties. Storyblocks is entirely royalty-free, meaning you can use their stuff for any commercial or personal project without having to think about it down the line. I've used Storyblocks from the beginning, and I can tell you from personal experience that it's been a crucial resource for this channel and channels like it. If you're making videos already or want to become a creator, give Storyblocks a try. Click the button on screen or head to storyblocks.com slash Wendover to sign up, and you'll be supporting Wendover while you're at it.